Let us pray. Father, we bless you and thank you for today, for the goodness that you have given us, allowing us to assemble together in your presence. We pray that you yourself will lead us, grant us understanding of your word, to the effect that it will change our lives to your glory in our words with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to look at another psalm. Here is Psalm 116, and it has been entitled, When God Delivers from a Life-Threatening Situation. This psalm, um, it's not very clear who wrote it, but it comes back to either David or Hezekiah. And we, should, we are going to take the Hezekiah route and try to see what lessons that we can learn from this. Um, a man who was grateful because he was delivered from death and what our attitude should be when we find ourselves in such situation. So I'll read Isaiah 38, verse 1 to 5. It says, in those days, was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came unto him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and in perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept so. Then came the word of God to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thou said the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, have seen thy tears. Behold, I will add unto thee thy days fifteen years. So it is believed that this is when this psalm was written. So somebody who was at the verge of death and received reprieve from the Lord. So we can compare this to the salvation experience that when we repent and receive Christ, the Lord delivers us from spiritual death. And this is recorded in Romans 6.23. It says the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And here also, also in Colossians, it says that, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, being forgiven you of all your trespasses? So again, when we receive Christ, he's just like we've been delivered from death unto life. So if we compare to what Hezekiah said here, we want to learn lessons from it. Before we continue, I would like to read the whole of Psalm 116, and then we'll see the lessons that we can draw from, from it. It says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ears unto me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The sorrow of death compassed me, and the pains of hell but hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I call upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord? for all his benefits towards me. I'll take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I'll pay my vows unto the Lord, now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I'm thy servant. I'm thy servant and the son of thy handmaid. 
thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord. Now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. So this is what comes out, something that we have to learn from. We can divide the Psalms into four parts. The first part talks about confession, bold confession. And the major theme is, I love the Lord, which is from verses one to four. The second part is the profession of God's goodness, verses five to nine. And then comes putting his faith in God and that his hope will not be in anyone else. No one can deliver except God. Then he comes to the last part of it. He talks about his commitment to the Lord. This is something that I hope that we will learn from the psalmist and then learn lessons from him. And moving again from verses one to four, where he made the bold confession, he said, I love the Lord. And his testimony is, I love the Lord. Can we also give testimony and say we love the Lord? Let's think about it. God has saved his life, and in his heart he is overflowed with passion for the Lord, deep love for the Lord. Here the Hebrew word which is described here as I love the Lord is less of emotion and more of an action. And that is why Jesus put it in another way that if you love me, obey my command. So loving God actually results in performance of action, that we do something when we love God. When we love God, we obey his word. We obey his commandments. And then he goes on, the psalmist goes on to say, because he has heard my voice and my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me. So again, he's talking about his gratitude to God. God has graciously heard his supplication or his cries for mercy. Supplication here means an earnest plea for favor from one who is helpless. So the family considered his case self helpless, Hezekiah in our case, and he pleaded God for mercy and God granted him mercy. So mercy also here refers to stooping down and showing kindness to an inferior person. So God stooped down, he inclined his ears, paid attention to the cry of the psalmist. And even as the psalmist begged God, God heard his prayer and he answered it. So from there, the psalmist come back and say that, I love the Lord. It is something that we should also be doing if we reflect or contemplate on the salvation that God has given us. Can we say that we love the Lord in a like manner? That is something that, um, I would say we should be encouraged to do. And then he goes on to say, the sorrows of death compass me about, and the pains of hell had got hold up upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then call I upon the name of the Lord. Oh Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. And before I go on here, let me move back and a little bit about the verse too. Again, he said, because he has inclined his ear unto me, therefore I'll call upon him as long as I live. Here, this is the response of the psalmist. God has heard him, so he made his mind that as long as he lives, he will call on the Lord. He will call upon the name of the Lord. So his confidence in God has searched to such a point that as long as he lives, he will continue to call upon the Lord. That is what we should be doing. And then here he knew from experience that God hears and answers prayer. So maybe we should cast our mind upon when God saved us and know that God answers prayer. So when we come to him, we will not hesitate. And that when we read again, the sorrows of death compass me and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. So here, he was in danger of death, as we refer to Hezekiah. 
the sorrows of death was all around. He was going completely and he was afraid. He wasn't ready to die. So the pains and anguish of hell um, and the grave was really threatening to him. So he called upon the Lord to deliver his soul and the Lord did. And here the word which is used for hell is sure. And I'll digress a bit from um, the topic here, make comment about things which, um, some misunderstanding which goes on. The Bible has three, at least three different ways that it's used for hell, what the English Bible translates as hell. The first one is called Shoal in the Old Testament or in Greek Hades. And that basically means underground or underworld rather, the place of the dead. That is where Jesus went, as it's said in Acts chapter 2, verse 26. And when Jesus died, that is when died, that is where he went. He didn't go to the other places. The second one that we know of is the word Tataros, which is really we call the hellish component, or hell in that sense in English, for the lack of a good word. And that is where the angels who sinned um, have been put for punishment, for torment. And if you read a bit of Genesis, it looks like they try to cooperate with human beings and God has put them there to be tormented. Second Peter 2, 4 talks about it. This is not where Jesus went. Jesus went to show where human beings were kept, where those who were dead were kept. And then the third one that the Bible talks about is Gehenna, which is referred to as hell. And here we see one um, in Luke 12, 5. That is what Jesus normally referred to as the lake of fire. Currently, there's no one in this Gehenna lake of fire. So the idea that some people keep saying that when Jesus died, he went to hell and the devil suppressed him is just fantasy. It's mere fantasy. That is not biblical. Biblically, Jesus went to Hades and there that was the place of the dead where everybody who died went as a human being. He didn't go to Tartarus where demons have been put for torment. Neither did he go to Gehenna. Gehenna, there's no one there at the moment. This is just a little bit of digression. So the psalmist was afraid that he would die, and he goes to Hades, he goes to Sheol, the underworld, the place of the dead, and he wasn't ready to die at the moment. So he called upon God, and God heard him. So in his situation, he was overtaken by terror, fearing that it might be his last. So he desperately called, cried to the Lord for help, and the Lord listened to his pleas for deliverance, the Lord cared about his pain and anguish, and he came to the rescue. So if we compare to ourselves here um, in the salvation process, that we sh should openly confess our love for the Lord, because here the psalmist talk about I love the Lord. If indeed we are saved, we should be able to uh, confess our love for the Lord and then put it in action that as we love God, we need to obey and then when the Lord answers our prayers, we should also be grateful in heart and show more um, passion towards him that our, our, our love for him should swell in this sense as even the psalmist expressed. I believe that is what the Lord uh, requires of us if, if we say we love him. And as the Lord said in Mark 12, 30, he says, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So meaning that knowing that God has saved us, our attitude should be love towards God. And love towards God is basically obeying the commandments of God, obeying what the Lord has told us and from his word, mainly. And one thing that we should know that even if God doesn't deliver us from any dire circumstances or something that we are really looking forward to, we should always remember that he has delivered us from sin by providing salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, that he has set us free from sin's power and he has, we've been rescued from sin's penalty and one day he will set us free from sin's presence even as we live forever with the Lord in the new earth and the new heaven. Because of his great love for us, 
we should love the Lord intensely, I would say. And even as first John 4, 19 says that we love him because he first loved us. So we should consider the love of God towards us and reciprocate and show our love towards him. We should also be able to testify boldly of what the Lord has done for us as much as we love him. And if we look at what Moses told Israel in Deuteronomy 10, 12, he says, and now Israel, what are the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. So here again, what God requires of us is to love him and to serve him with earnestness. And this one applies mainly, I will say, more to Christians whom God has delivered from darkness into light. He brought us out of the powers of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ, that we should reciprocate. The normal thing which should happen, I will say, is for us to love the Lord back. So we should love God, always reflect on what he's done for us. Then we come to the part where the psalm that professed God's goodness, verses five to nine. So he could not keep his silence up for what the Lord has done for him. So he professed the goodness of God to all who will listen, if I can say. And he was determined to walk with the Lord every day of his life. That should be our attitude, to walk with the Lord every day in our lives. So verse five says, gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. And in his suffering, the Son is called on the name of the Lord. And God's name represents his character and attribute of everything that he is. Three of them that the Son is mentioned here, but he found God to be gracious. This righteous means that God is always does the right thing, and he's always right in whatever he does. And he also the mercies of God. So we should know this and relate to God in this respect, the grace of God towards us through Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, which requires that we should be punished by the grace has given us and the mercy of God towards us, that Jesus came to die for us. We should look at it in that way. And then he goes on in verse six to say, the Lord preserved the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Meaning here that the psalmist was saved from death, so he declares that the Lord preserved the simple. Here, simple is referring to a person with childlike dependence on God, meaning he, because he depended on God fully, just like a child would depend on the mother, not worried about anything. That is what God requires of us, that if we can trust him fully, like a child would trust the parent, he will preserve us means we are simple, we are not second guessing or anything. Our faith and confidence is in the Lord. So he considering himself as an example that he can testify that he was helped by the Lord and the Lord merciful saved him, that he was brought low but the Lord helped him because he went to God just like a child who go to parents, not worrying about anything, asking anything at all. And if we do, we go to the Lord in, with that attitude. Even if it's wrong, we know that the Lord will put things right and lead us in the right direction, just like a child who will ask anything from the parent without even worrying about whether it will be granted or not, because his confidence or her confidence is in the parents. So it's the attitude that we should be having towards the Lord. And verse 7 says, Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with thee. So here he comes to the point where so confident with the Lord that the Lord will preserve him. So he goes on to say that ah, I'm relaxed. My soul is at rest. Everything is fine because the Lord has dealt nicely with him, bountifully with him. So because God's, of God's touch, all the fear is vanished. That should be our attitude that if we can trust the Lord fully, all fears will vanish from us. His soul was at rest at once, released from every threat of death, and peace and security slipped his soul. So he was so peaceful. Why? Because he has put his trust in the Lord, just like a child. And then 
he was completely at peace and nothing was bothering him. And if we move on again, and going to verse eight, um, going to verse eight, let me read it again. It says, for thou hast delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. So now he is cool, he is relaxed, he is called upon the Lord, and every fear is gone. He is relaxed. The person who was at the point of death, the fear of death is gone from him, but he is praising God. He is saved from death and tears. The Lord has kept him from stumbling into doubt and unbelief also. As he said here, so he did not lose his faith. He said, Thou hast delivered my soul, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Means the Lord is the one who has sustained him, who has prevented him from um, losing faith. And here also, if we look at Jude 1 24, it says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceedingly joy. So here, if we cast our mind upon salvation, meaning that God is the one who is going to keep us. God has our back. He's the one who's going to make sure that we make it. We make it to heaven in that sense. So here the psalmist knew that God has saved his life and always for a purpose that what he says. He thinks that should be our attitude to when God delivers us or answers our prayer. We must understand that that has been done for a purpose and we should seek that and then follow it. One of the purpose for God saving the life is, is depicted in Psalm 56, 13. Actually, because God wants unbroken fellowship with him. That Psalm says, that for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Will not thou deliver my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living. So the fellowship of God, walking before God, is one of the reasons that God saves us. And we should always remember that when we are saved. And so what does he do? He vowed to spend the rest of his life walking before the Lord. So this has made him such a way that, wow, he said, wow, as for God, I will never turn back. I've, somebody says, I've made my mind. I will never turn back. That is the sort of attitude that we should have. So if we want to look at some lessons, the sun is physical. Deliverance, well, if we want to compare it with the spiritual deliverance that we have, we should profess God's goodness in saving us before other people. It is God's goodness that has led us to Him. As even He says in Romans 2 4, all despises thou the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads thee to repentance. So it's because of the goodness of God that we are saved. And in that sense, our way should be graceful. And when we believe God in a childlike faith comes to him as a child, he saved us and delivered us from eternal death by giving us eternal life. That is all God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And as Romans 6, 23 confirms it, for the wages of sin is there, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the Lord has given us eternal life through Jesus Christ, if we're comparing the situation that the Son is had with our situation as Christians. And with deliverance, God gives peace and rest to our souls at the Son's experience, that he was completely at rest when God delivered him. So if you want to cut back to Ephesians, Philippians 4, 7, it says, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. So made him Deliverance of God comes with peace when we trust the Lord fully for the things he's done. And as Christians, we know that we've been delivered. We should have the peace of God, which passes all understanding. We should keep our mind and heart, hearts in Christ Jesus that we will be relaxed, even in this tumultuous time that we have corona all over and nobody knows the direction that is going. Our trust should be in the Lord and he is the one who is going to keep us. And if we, another lesson that we can also learn is that the Lord secures us through his mighty power. Even as Timothy said in 2 Timothy 1, 12, 
for which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, meaning that the power of God will be able to lead us through life and eventually into his presence that we should not fear. All we need to do is keep obeying his word, keep on his commandment, come to the Lord with childlike faith and confidence in him, and all will be well. And he says he keeps us from falling away also from unbelief. That is one thing that Thessalonians 3, 22 talks about. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. All of the above um, are offered unto us if we believe. And these are some of the lessons that we should learn from the psalmist for his situation. Then he goes again, the third part, putting his faith in God and not having confidence in man. In verse 10 says, I believe, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are lies. So probably he tried to rely on people and he was failed. Or, so he came to the conclusion that all men are lies. And here the idea is we should not put our trust in God. Um, throughout his ordeal, the psalmist did not hear Ezekiel, did not lose faith in God. His experience has taught him an important lesson that we should learn also, that we should place our confidence in God and not in other people. And Solomon says in a funny way, says it in a funny way in Proverbs 25, 19, he says, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a broken tooth and a foot out of joint. So here, Solomon is making it clear that if you put your trust, your confidence in a man who is unfaithful and at a particular time that you need help, you'll be disappointed and it will be painful as um, you have your foot out of joint. So if you, you've had a fracture before, the pain that one receives, that is how painful that um, Solomon is describing it here in Proverbs. And also Psalm 118 put it in another way. It is better to trust the Lord, to trust in the Lord and to put confidence in man. And it's even said in another place that curse is any man who put his trust in man, who has made the arm of flesh um, his refuge. That the Lord God Almighty is telling us that our confidence should be in the Lord. Yes, he can use somebody um, in helping us or dealing with the situation. But our attention and everything should be with the Lord. Here, if we rely on men in that sense, without God first, we are likely to be um, disappointed. So our confidence should be in the Lord. So in the midst of life threatening situation, he kept his confidence in God and never wavered. Even though he was in great affliction, his faith never faltered. He never questioned or God or doubted. Faith should not be women. We should always believe in God in that sense. And we should note that if we put our trust in others, we are likely to be disappointed because humans, um, as they are, cannot be trusted fully. It's only God who could be trusted. <laughs> so we can say that Satan may fiercely attack us, um, our faith in God, but we should resist this temptation to doubt God and stick to God. And Paul faced a similar situation um, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 14. He talked about how he was perplexed, threatened, beat down and all that. But in all, um, he never lost confidence in God. So in 2 Corinthians 4, 13, what he said was, we have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe, and therefore I spoke it. We also believe and therefore speak. Here he is contrasting exactly what Psalm 116 says, that in a difficult situation, when they are pressed, you are pressed down, that under normal circumstances, humanly speaking, you give up. He said, no, he knows what is believed. He is having the same spirit of faith that according as it is written, I believe, therefore I speak, that we should speak the word of faith when we are, um, 
really press down because the Lord God Almighty, his word is true. So as I believe, therefore I've spoken, we also believe, so we speak. But in a, um, um, when one is in a hard situation, a hard corner, that is something that we should come to mind. And we should never lose faith in God. We believe and therefore we speak. Job also had the same problem. He lost his wealth, he lost his children, and his health. And the wife pleaded with him to curse God and die. For probably she thought that was the end of Job. Job refused to sin by speaking against God carelessly. And what did he say? We we'll read it in Job 2, 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, Does thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, he did not sin with his lips, meaning that he did not sin against God or lay accusation against God. But as Paul says, we believe, therefore we speak, our trust is in God. And even under that circumstance, we should not um, do so. So like Paul, like Job, like the psalmist, we need to guard our lips diligently and never to speak against God. Instead, we should always speak from the heart that trusts God unconditionally. We need to express our utmost confidence in Him, irrespective of the situation. So even now the Psalm 71, 15 says, My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the days, for I know the number thereof. So what we should say towards God is always to trust Him, in that sense, because he loves the Lord deeply. Um, the psalmist, the next session, talked about recommitting himself to the Lord. He decided that he would do something in return for God's goodness, and that what he did was to recommit himself to the Lord and here publicly. He stated it that because the Lord has delivered him from death, he would praise the Lord. And if we read our verse 13, he says, I will take the cup of salvation and I call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant, I am thy servant, and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bonds. I will offer to thee the sacrifices of thanksgiving. So in an effort to repay God, he, has, he made six promises to God. He promised to honor him for salvation and to fulfill his promises. Like here, he talks about lifting up the cup of salvation, which is a form of presenting a drink offering to the Lord, so the form of thanksgiving, meaning that you honor God in all circumstances and give thanks to him. But secondly, he promised to be faithful and call upon the name of the Lord, meaning that he will always trust God and put God first. He also promised to fulfill his vows to God openly. It means he's going to do that openly for all to see. And here I will say a testimony of God's goodness. Um, we should not neglect when God does good for us and um, probably answers our prayers. We should not stick, um, keep it to ourselves, but rather and proclaim it openly for God to be glorified. And for he promised to convey how deeply God cares about the suffering and the death of his people. As the psalmist was close to death, he felt probably the tender love of God, and he learned that death of the saints is precious to him. Here it is a little bit hard um, for one to say that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, but that is exactly what the Lord says that that we are precious in his sight, even if we are dying, that no believer dies alone, for the Lord is always there. So he learned that the death of God's saints is precious to him. And Jesus taught it in another way when he talked about Lazarus, um, when he died, that angels speak him to Abraham Bosom. Um, let me read in Luke 16, 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham Kosu. The rich man also died and was buried. So in death of the child of God, um, it's, it's Paul put it in bluntly that 
to be absent in the body is to be in the presence of the Lord, meaning that when we die, it's so precious to the Lord that we take it straight into his presence. Um, and so in agreement with that, the psalmist says that though nobody wants to die, um, God forbid, but the Lord says that if it should happen to anyone, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints, that life still goes on after death, the Lord is with us. Then, um, fifthly, he promised to give himself anew to the Lord because of what God has done for him. God has set him free from his bondage. He presented himself at first to the Lord as a servant. So that is why he said that I am your servant. So he committed to give himself anew to the Lord. That should be our attitude. Can we tell the Lord that we are the same hand of the Lord? Same hand of the Lord means that we are prepared to do whatever he tells us to do. That we should, Christian, that is what our attitude should be. And the simply, he promised to thank the Lord publicly and to call on his name. Here he stated that I'll offer sacrifices of thanksgiving for all to know. Moving again also, he talk about renewal of his vows in verse 18 and 19. He says, I'll pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord house, in the midst of thee, O Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Here the lesson that probably we should learn is from, from this is an outstanding example of the sadness that we ought to do for the Lord in return for his goodness. Um, so we should be able to honor and praise the Lord for the great salvation he has offered us and to continually offer sacrifices of praise to him, just as Hebrews 13, 15 says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. So when we contemplate on salvation, we should be able to have attitudes of thanksgiving to the Lord almost always. And then another thing that we should never hesitate to call on him for anything and everything we need. For we are the children of God, as the word of God says, we should go to him with childless um, attitudes, as the psalmist say, in a simple mind, and the Lord God Almighty will hear, hear us. And then we should be able to keep our promises and commitments that we have made to him, and be able to present ourselves as the Lord's servants afresh and anew. The servant does whatever the master says in that respect, that we should and present ourselves. When we say that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, if he's the Lord, means we are servants and we should be able to commit ourselves to him and do whatever he wants us to do. And that is something that we should be aspiring to or praying for the Lord to help us if we lack in this direction. We should, it is also reasonable service because of his great mercies towards us. And Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So we should be able to do this, to show our gratefulness to God for salvation and everything he has done for us. We should be willingly and fully committed ourselves to him. We should not take his deliverance and blessing for granted. We should reciprocate with the love of God. And we should serve him faithfully and wholeheartedly. We should praise him and openly before all people and encourage others to trust him. That the Lord God is good. Can we say with the psalmist that we love the Lord because he has given, he has heard our prayers. Or our call for salvation has been answered. May the Lord add his blessings to this, that our work with him will be in the right direction. Amen. Amen.